Hi guys, we're <laughs> we are uh, we're figuring this out. Oh, we have thirty five. Wow. Okay, we're getting folks <laughs> we're getting folks in here. I gotta I gotta text Dean and let him know that those guys need to come into here. We have fifty eight participants. Let's just see. We're gonna get this going here. Just a second, folks, and we'll um, get going. We have two, uh, there were kind of two sessions going on. So um, <laughs> I don't know how or what happened, but uh, we're gonna get there at some point. Thanks for your patience, guys. Looks like, oh my, we have lots of people in the waiting room. I'm just gonna admit all of them. Wow. Hi, <laughs> Hi guys. Um, hey, we've got, um, we're trying to get people from two different rooms connected here. So um, just give us a minute and you know, we'll get everybody connected and uh, we'll move forward here. Now I'm in. And, you may want to uh, mute your, your microphones while we're waiting here. We don't get any, any feedback. Look at all the people. Holy cow. All right. Oh, yeah. 80, 92 participants. Whoa. Okay. All right, folks. Thanks for being thanks for being patient. Dean just gave you a just text me and said it is on. They're on their way. It's like there's going to be 95 of us so far in here. So, wow, excellent. Thanks everybody for being here today and for you know being patient with uh, technology. You guys are saying, yeah, well, that's what we dealt with all spring, I'm guessing, right? In terms of all the tech issues that arose out of here. So um, getting you going here. All right, now we're at 95 or 96. Um, feel free to use the chat. Uh, looks like we have a couple folks uh, that. <laughs> Other sessions are just going to be a flood of folks just starting to open up now. Yeah, there was an issue with some of the, um, the links. Um, so I think hopefully we'll get those figured out for the upcoming sessions here and um, we can go from there. Yeah, there's, you're right. There is a flood of people. There's 99. Oh, we just hit 100. Look at that. Looks like Dean made it in here somewhere. Oh, there he is. Mr. Phillips, you're with us, aren't you? I am, I think. <laughs> Hopefully we got everybody migrated over here from that other room too. Just a uh, just point of clarification, if you have questions, uh, again, probably the easiest way with this many people is to use the chat. So if you want to, um, if you want to ask a question, you have uh, thoughts or other ideas about how we can use the, the, the tool that we're showing, please let us know. Yeah, don't hesitate to, to let us know. Um, Dean, I just made you a co-host, so you should have that access now. Excellent. We only have... Um, 77 slides to get through, so um, I'm not sure we're going to make it all. You don't think we're going to make it? I don't, I don't think so. 
<laughs> we will for give some, you the link. <laughs> for some reason, I don't think we're going to make it either. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. And hopefully you can see that link uh, on that first slide. And if you just give me a quick thumbs up there, and let me know that that's working for folks. Perfect. Good. So we're going to talk about some of the Google tools um, for student engagement. And um, many of you know some of these Google tools, right? We always, uh, I'm, I'm chuckling because of all of the screen names. So just so you know, you can rename yourself if you wish. If you find your little thumbnail, you can click on the three dots in your in your view there and choose rename. Um, and then you can you can change your name from something that doesn't maybe make sense to something that will allow us to know who you are. Excellent. So we're going to talk about some of the uh, Google tools uh, that maybe are lesser known tools to many of you. And so most of us um, know about the Google Docs and the Google Slides and Gmail and all of those great things. And maybe even some of you are using Classroom but we're gonna go down this rabbit hole of uh, a whole bunch of uh, other Google tools that maybe are lesser known that you haven't seen. And we're gonna go through them pretty quickly. So again, if you want to um, paste that shortened URL into chat, Jeff, for folks, that might help as well. Okay. And that is and, a, yeah, that is a I, AI in there. So just so you know. I'll post it in the chat now for sure. Perfect. And so as we continue to talk about these tools, um, we'll, just, we'll just go ahead and jump in here. Again, it's gonna go really fast. We have until noon to do this, so just about an hour. And at any time, feel free to jump on the mic, ask a question, type your question into chat. We are gonna be monitoring chat as well. So, um, a couple ways to communicate with us during the presentation today. Um, we're going to go ahead and skip the introductions because most of you know who we are. And if you didn't, you probably got that introduction on the keynote this morning. So um, here we go. We're going to talk about the first pieces. Um, and many of these first pieces are going to be geo tools. So Google Earth. How many of you have checked out the new Google Earth? So in the old days, we had to download Google Earth. Um, Today, it becomes web-based. We can jump into Google Earth and navigate uh, even on Chromebooks now. So it works great. One of the great things that they have are these, uh, what they're calling these voyages. And so they've compiled all of these great opportunities for you and your students to take these virtual uh, field trips, right? And so now, especially now that we're online, these virtual field trips may become even more necessary for us to get our kids out to explore um, in different areas. And remember inside of Google Earth, there's also 3D rendering. So you can jump into um, what they call street view using Pegman and get actual street imagery inside of all of these great cities and towns. And so thinking about being able to take your kids to um, um, different different areas, right? So maybe you are jumping into New York and you're seeing downtown New York or, or you're jumping over to the Statue of Liberty or whatever the case is. Those are real life pictures that you're gonna be able to see in 360 degrees. So you'll be able to scroll around. So Google Earth is one of those first tools that we like to talk about. If you haven't used My Maps, My Maps is really good. Um, my Maps allows you to do area calculations, um, draw shapes, paths, all of those great things. Um, what we like about My Maps is that then you can share those out, right? So think about creating a map with maybe you have a perimeter problem in the map and you're going to say, all right, uh, figure out the perimeter of the outline shape on the map or, or you give them the problem of, all right, here's the parking lot. If a car takes up six square meters, how many cars can you park in that parking lot? So now they have to do a, a math problem associated with a place, right? So lots of different ways to use our geo tools inside of, of education. The next one is Google Lit Trips. Many of you have probably heard of this before, but um, uh, we've been able to uh, take 
information from a literature document or, or a, a novel and basically place that setting on the face of the earth, right? So um, uh, it's a really good way to visualize a setting of a book or the events that take place in a novel. And these lit trips are very well done, professionally made, um, and uh, they integrate nicely with the new Google Earth as well. So he's converting some of those over into the new Google Earth. Again, if you have questions, just moderating that chat. So um, do drop those in. So uh, lit, uh, real quick, Dean, lit trips, grade level. Um, lit trips, there are um, books that have been uh, turned into lit trips for all grade levels. So K through 12. Um, it's worth, if you haven't uh, been to lit trips, it's worth just going in and taking a look around because it is pretty phenomenal what Jerome um, Berg has done with those uh, trips. And then like Dean said, the conversion that's happening now uh, works well inside of the web-based Google Earth. Yeah, excellent. So Google Tour Builder. So in the old Google Earth, we were able to create these tours and kind of take you through a sequential um, uh, event, uh, kind of like a virtual field trip. Now, uh, Tour Builder is still available, but some of this is baked into Google Earth now too. So Google Earth has new creation tools. So again, um, all of these tools kind of work nicely and, and talk to each other and they're kind of trying to merge Tour Builder in with Google Earth. So check out both, both tools. Um, and with these tools, you can kind of have your students create their own lit trip, right? So maybe instead of a book report, you're gonna say, all right, create a, a literature trip inside of Google Earth or inside of Google Maps as you use these tools. Um, Google Arts and Culture. Now, if you go to this link, you're gonna be lost for at least an hour. Um, there's so much content behind the Google Arts and Culture. And so you can search for different things. You can take virtual field trips through museums around the world. Um, you can zoom into high resolution photography of paintings and artifacts that are in these museums. And it, it really allows you to kind of lose yourself in all of these, these places and these items. Um, one of the things that we really like about the Google Arts and Culture is that it's all a link, right? So it's all web-based. So think about using Google Classroom or Seesaw and pasting these links in, and now your students can go there easily without having to navigate to a whole bunch of websites to find this resource, right? So um, Google Arts and Culture is a great resource. Uh, it also has some um, historical artifacts in there as well as um, those those documents that we're supposed to use in our education, in our teaching, right? Those, those historical documents. And so give those a shot. Um, Google arts and culture, Jeff, jump in anytime. Okay. I'm good. I can go to the next one. All right. Uh, performing arts. So again, arts and culture, um, their cultural Institute here, um, which has a perform performing arts section. So a 360 degree, you know, video performances in, in music and opera and theater and dance. So if you haven't experienced that, um, the image that you're seeing there, you can actually walk around this orchestra and, and, and being be in different places um, and listen to the different instruments as you get closer or further away. It's super, super cool. Um, but like Dean said, the, the, the issue is that you're going to get lost in this for a very long time. And that may not be an issue, right? That may be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. So, um, trying to do some chat here, Google cardboard. Um, this is relatively new. Most of you have probably seen this by now, but, uh, Google Cardboard allows you to immerse yourself into this 3D virtual environment, right? So using these goggles and a mobile device and 360 degree imagery, you're able to immerse yourself in this environment. You put these goggles on, you look around. Um, some even have headphones that come with them and it pipes in the sound. So it really makes you feel like you're standing right there, right? When these first came out, Jeff and I um, had an opportunity to view them and um, they took us up in an elevator and the elevator door opens. Of course, this is all virtual. We're wearing these goggles and have our headphones on. 
and the elevator door opens and there's nothing. The first step out of the elevator is like 60 stories up in this, this skyscraper. And it really made you kind of stumble around and, and feel like you're going to fall down, down the hole. But, um, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, one of the new things, new ways that this is being used is they're actually using uh, 360 imagery. They're having somebody stand right behind the quarterback on the, on the football field. And they're recording that imagery from the quarterback's perspective. And then the quarterback or whomever can put these goggles on and go through their defensive read progressions, right? So in a virtual environment, they can practice without having to be on the field. And so there's lots of ways to apply this virtual um, technology to learning, to, um, to industry, all of those kinds of things. So give Google Cardboard a, a, a look. It's, it's really an interesting technology. Google Expeditions, kind of the same thing, but the Expeditions are these vetted content that you're gonna use these goggles with. So think about putting these goggles on and going on this virtual immersive 3D field trip, right? So instead of just two dimensions, you have three dimensions. You also have some audio associated with that. Um, there's a list of current Expeditions there, just a, a, a great way to view some of this new content um augmented reality uh we talked about tour creator uh the google cardboard camera so th there's an app for your ios or your android devices that allows you to actually create these 360 imagery that you can then use in your google cardboard goggles so if you want to move from that consumer where your students are just consuming content to that creation piece you could actually have your students create a google um, 3D tour of your town, or maybe you have a historical place in your community that um, you can you can get more publicity to by by recording and creating this virtual content, and then having people consume that content in a virtual environment using the Google Cardboard goggles. So lots of ways to do that, right? Um, fun with geography. So GeoGuessr is a great game. We tried this yesterday with a school group and it's changed a little bit. We do think that you have to buy this one now, but um, it's well worth it. It's not very expensive. And basically you get a snapshot of somewhere on the earth. And then the closer you put your pin to that location, the more points you accumulate. So it's kind of a game-based um, geography lesson. Smarty pins, very similar. Um, you're interacting with Google Maps and you're creating these pins and you're playing a, a quick little trivia game. Um, Street View and Tracks, much like Expeditions, we can jump into Google Street View. These tracks are places that maybe Street View doesn't go. So th think about this 3D camera on your back, on a camel, on a, on a bicycle, and now we can go down trails and uh, view all of these wonderful places that cars maybe can't go to. So in the past, street view was limited to where the car would go. And now our, our street view treks are um, where any camera can go, whether it's a backpack. One really cool one is they put it on a zip line in a jungle and they take the camera through the jungle on this zip line so you get to see um, what the jungle, jungle looks like from uh, an elevated position. So um, check those out as well. Um, Landlines, go ahead, Jeff. You want me to jump in, Dean? I can, I can yep. help you. Uh, pe people are still trying to get into our session here. <laughs> if, uh -huh. hey, so, so real quick, if you have people that are still trying to get in, um, if you will, we'll, we'll have them refresh the page, if they're texting you, refresh the page that they're getting the pulling the link from and then um, have them try to access that again. I mean, obviously there are 115 of you in here. So um, you guys found that link. If you have any um, thoughts or hints on how you guys got in, what you had to do, if you want to put those in the chat, that'd be great. Google landlines. Um, you can actually draw uh, lines on your, um, on your screen and basically what Google does is it goes out and finds imagery that fits the shape of that line. It's actually a pretty cool kind of AI um, 
type of experience using um, what they call Chrome experiments. So these are kind of the, the not, they haven't been released to the general public yet, but uh, some pretty neat stuff in there that you can find. Uh, the next one, let's see, Google Mar or Google Maps. A lot of people don't know this, but if you go to Google Maps and you zoom out and you continue to zoom out all the way, then what you then have the ability to do is look at other planets. So you can look at Google Mars, you know, you can look at Mars and, and lots of different views. And um, so once you hit the outer space, um, you can then see views from the, um, uh, of, of different planets. So it's a pretty cool way of, of looking at um, your celestial objects, right? Instead of just uh, looking at the Earth. All right. What's next? Access, access Mars, so WebVR. So this is taking the um, data from Curiosity and um, the different missions that went to Mars. They're taking that data now and they're turning it into a 360 degree virtual experience. So that's worth kind of checking out. They put it into, into a VR type of, um, of um, system there. So it's taking and it's using only the data that the the rovers have brought back and not uh, the, the entire planet. So you see there's just certain areas on Mars that have been, um, they're using. And then next, let's see, we're just gonna kind of keep going through. Um, we can use Google Maps to actually take and look for or, or create these, these treks and, and um, they have text, pictures, audio files and, and different things in, a, in kind of a central location. So what we're doing is we're tying other types of data into this spatial data. And I think that's really important as we start to think about, um, you know, all data has a place or over 80% of data they say has a place. So um, it's important that uh, we kind of connect those two pieces there and these treks allow you to do that. Excellent, so the next one is um, Google One Today. And so One Today is just an app that allows um, allows you to explore a whole bunch of different nonprofits and it becomes kind of the social component too, where you can see where your, your friends are donating, friends being in your contact list, and you can, um, you know, match those donations if you so choose. So that's just kind of a, that social aspect to that Google platform, right? So um, those nonprofits. All right, so now we're going to get into the creation piece of some of these other Google tools, and we're hey, just going to real jump quick. There. Yeah, oh, a real quick, just so you know, somebody asked about the the are we going to be able to access this PowerPoint? And then the answer is yes. I just put that link in the chat there, so if you um, didn't get that when you when we first started, um, I put it back in there, so those of you that came in a little bit later um, can have that. Excellent. So Internet Awesome, many of you have heard of this. This is kind of their, their digital citizenship piece, right? So they're using this game-based um, interface in Google called Interland to um, have students kind of participate in this game, which then teaches them the, um, the ethics of being online and the safety of being online and all of those great things that's um, in a game-based format. So. If you haven't used this with your kids, this is a, is a great tool. Um, Toontastic 3D, many of you have seen Toontastic as maybe as an, an iPad app. Um, Google acquired it and it's become a web app. So now you can use it on Chromebooks and um, any web browser, all of those great things. So um, think about how you can, again, ask your kiddos to, or your students to create um, cartoons to do different things in your classroom, right? Um, again, a Google product that works really, really well. All right. Um, Google Computer Science Summer Institute. Um, this is a three week, we'll just kind of skip over this one. This is kind of a face to face class that probably isn't happening this summer. So we'll skip that one. Google's made with code. Um, this is an an interesting one because it has lots of different sites with uh, opportunities to connect with women in industries. It's, it's project or blockly based. So it's kind of that drag and drop block coding. Um, and many of us start with our students in that, that computer programming with that blockly interface, right? So we're going to drag those blocks over to create our, our programs. So lots of ways for our kids to participate in coding activities using the block 
coding um, instead of that syntax coding. So made with code. Um, CS first, this is a program that Google will actually send to your class, send to your school. If you sign up for it, um, it comes in a whole box. It's a full curriculum of computer science and computer programming. Um, and it, it's really a good, um, a good piece of curriculum to use in your schools. How many of you have CS first in your schools? Anybody? Okay. Um, definitely check that one out. Again, it's free. You sign up for it. You don't have to pay for it. And um, Google will send that out to your schools if you're interested in doing computer science or coding in your, in your schools. Project Blocks. This is a, um, a, a newish research project by Google. So instead of using virtual blocks, they've created these physical blocks that you move around on the table, you connect it to a device, um, lights, um, a speaker, whatever the case may, may be, and you can do uh, programming in a hands-on type environment instead of just on a screen. So Project Blocks is really cool. Um, I'm not sure if they're still available, but it would be something to check out if you have some money to spend for sure. Um, this one, I don't know if any of you like word games, um, but this is a machine learning. So again, this artificial intelligence that's coming around doing different things. And this is a game that, um, that you play, you type a word you most associate with and um, Google's AI changes it and it matches your word on the bottom. Um, it's just kind of a really interesting way that artificial intelligent artificial intelligence reacts to something you do on a computer screen. So take a look at that one. Do you want me to go, Dean? I'll, I'll, uh, I'm sorry, I've been trying to troubleshoot everybody to get in here. So um, Google Talk to Books, a new way again, we're seeing a lot of AI types of, um, of uh, tools here that Google's created here. Google Talk to Books really basically you make a statement or you ask a question about a passage and they use this tool to find sentences and books that relate to that um, statement that you've made. So that's worth kind of taking a look at and, and um, playing with a little bit. Um, AI is, a, is incredibly powerful. We'll show you a couple of others here as we, as we move forward. Um, the Google Science Fair. So this is an online Google, you know, some of these projects that these um, young adults complete are phenomenal. Um, so, so it's worth kind of taking a look at this online Google Science Fair and, um, and the really intricate uh, science fair project that these individual students do is just is phenomenal. So um, check those out there and, you know, you can involve your own students in those as well. If you haven't seen this, uh, I'm a science teacher, so I love this app. So if you look at this um, uh, Google Science Journal, it's an app that actually uses your phone's uh, gyroscope and, and different sensors within your, um, with your, within your phone to actually record data. So it can record speed, acceleration, and different types of things. And um, it graphs that data in real time. And um, it's super, it's super powerful. It talks about, you know, 70 hands-on science experiments from education experts. So that's a great tool. Again, especially if you think about in a remote learning environment, you're teaching a seventh, eighth grade science class, a physics, physics class on motion. This might be a great tool to check out um, to, you know, get your kids involved in um, collecting data. All right, Dean, what do we got next? Ah, oh, this is one of my favorites. This is kind of a, this is, okay, I'm just going to say right off the bat, this is a time waster, all right? When you do this, it's going to be one of those that um, you will have a hard time walking away from. Quick draw, again, it's an AI piece. Um, basically, you're presented with a, an object that you have to draw using your mouse, and we already know that's not easy. And then what Google does is based on what you're drawing, it's trying to figure out what the picture is. Right, so it's going to give you the word, but it doesn't know what you're drawing until you start to draw, and it'll start to guess. And I think it gives you 20 seconds for each item to to, to draw it effectively, um, so that Google can guess what it is. And it's using AI and and thousands of other images that others have drawn in order to guess what you're drawing. 
So get yeah, lost this, in that one for sure. This is one you definitely need to use with your kiddos for sure. Auto draw is um, similar. It's using it's using AI. So many of us um, maybe use a smart board or something like that. And when you draw a shape, it kind of snaps to that shape. Well, Google Auto Draw does something very similar. It tries to predict what you're drawing, and then it will draw it better for you or more precise for you. Right. So think about using Google Auto Draw to draw some of those things that. Uh, you struggle with like this is a great example I'm going to try to draw a bike right and I want to use maybe this bike in a worksheet or a presentation or whatever um, but my bike doesn't look very good auto draws bike looks much better right because it's using that art artificial intelligence to draw that in a more accurate precise manner so auto draw is a is a great tool to use um, and and to kind of check out for sure um, Doodle for, Doodle for Google is an art project. It's an online art project that your kids can participate in. They do this every year. And um, basically you draw the Google launch page. Many of you have probably seen this at different times in the year where the Google launch page changes to that Google Doodle. Um, and they pick winners and the winners get big time scholarships, right? So um, uh, it's, it's a really neat program that your kids can participate in and potentially benefit them financially as well. Um, <laughs> Androidify, so we all know Bitmojis, right? And I have to say that carefully, Bitmojis um, uh, change our persona into a cartoon character. Well, Androidify changes our Bitmoji into an Android instead of just a Bitmoji. So if you wanna be a little bit more clever with your Bitmoji characters, you can Androidify yourself instead of uh, just a Bitmoji. Okay, um, SketchUp, uh, it's formerly SketchUp, it's, it's uh, formerly owned by Google, but this is now owned by uh, a private entity, but it's still really good. So uh, I know one of the hardest things for our industrial arts teachers is trying to move their curriculum into this online environment, right? How do I get AutoCAD to my kids? Because it's such a heavy program. It's so expensive. It's loaded on our, our computers at school. Um, SketchUp is that 3D drawing tool that's online. Um, it's mainly free. There is a fee for service. If you're really uh, advanced in your AutoCAD skills, you may need to uh, purchase that. But SketchUp really does allow you to design things. One of the cool things folks are doing with SketchUp is they're designing objects, artwork in SketchUp, and then they're using that SketchUp uh, drawing to actually move to a 3D printer and physically print what they've drawn in 3D. In, in 3D. So using SketchUp to create art and then using a 3D printer that your school may have to change that digital render into something physical, right? That they can touch and move and, and maneuver, manipulate. And so, and, and I can jump in here, Dean. So just align is an app. So this is uh, an app for your, uh, for your phone. And basically what it does, it allows you to draw in three dimensions. So you install the app on your phone and as you move through space, a line is drawn and then you can actually turn back around and look at that line that you've drawn. So it's a kind of an interesting, you know, take on art. Instead of drawing in a two-dimensional plane, we're actually increasing that to in, a, in another dimension, allowing users to create some amazing stuff. There's a great video there that's uh, linked off of there. It's called Just a Line. Then this next one is really a kind of a an extra piece to that. This tilt brush. Um, this involves um, some pretty significant amounts of uh, you know some some technology. Um, above and beyond your computer, but basically what it does is it turns your two, um, oh, I forget what they call them. Um, anyway, there, you have two paddles, I guess, in your hands and using those paddles, as you move through three dimensions, it actually allows you to draw in different colors and do some really amazing things. Um, Oculus Rift, one of these, a virtual, virtual reality system, got the goggles as well as the the earphones and, and you kind of get immersed in this um, alternative reality, I guess, and, and move through time and, and do different things. So that's a super cool 
two different um, three-dimensional tools there that uh, are really powerful. Blocks, um, 3D objects in virtual reality. So again, um, this is kind of moving in the virtual reality realm. So it allows you to use some simple tools to bring different applications and, and uh, your creations to life. So it's more of a, a, an open, um, open space that you can use to create um, basically whatever your, whatever your uh, creative mind allows you to do. Yeah, think of, think of uh, a little bit of Minecraft built in with art, right? So you're using blocks to, to build things um, outside of that Minecraft. Um, environment. Google Poly is another, is another tool. This kind of flows into the Google Tour Builder. So Poly um, is, a, is an environment that allows you to create three-dimensional objects as well as find three-dimensional objects. So there's a lot of, of um, websites out there and tools out there that allow you to embed three-dimensional objects into their environment or their ecosystem. And Google Poly is a place where you can actually download these three objects and put them into um, your virtual world. So it's pretty powerful. Um, and, and, you know, again, this is that kind of open source um, um, sharing that exists across the internet. So folks create, they put them up there and anybody can has the access to those and, and can use them. Oops, let's go the right way here. So Snapseed. Um, it's photo editing, right? So we all need that online photo editor and Snapseed is that, that place that allows us to do this. It's both iOS and Android. Um, and when you take your basic image, you can think about like those Snapchat filters. You can do filters on top of photographs, right? So, um, it's a great way to make your photos kind of pop maybe better contrast, better lighting, whatever the case is. So check out Snapseed photo editing. <laughs> peanut gallery. So the peanut gallery is a Chrome experiment. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because it uh, takes clips of your voice and um, you can share those clips with your friends. So it's just kind of a fun way to use speech into text and um, try some of those APIs in that Google Chrome environment. So the APIs are the, the integration with different tools inside of that Chrome environment. Okay. Um, inside Abbey Road, uh, this is another just kind of a, an experiment about um, bringing a historical event or in this case, a, a, you know, the, the British music into your virtual environment. So you can kind of walk down the paths that this, this group performed on. You can, you can listen to their audio, all of these different things inside of this virtual environment. And the OK Go Sandbox, um, this one's really cool. It's music videos in the classroom full of design challenges. And if we just kind of click on one, we haven't clicked on one yet. Let's just go to this one for example. So um, we're taking all of this um, video and we're putting it into lessons. Like um, for this one, it's called All Together Now. And you can see how all of these thumbnails have been merged together to produce one sound. So you can, you can think about, um, so there were some music teachers who did this over last spring, right? They put their chorus or their choir and their band together and they did it all virtually. Well, this is kind of that all together now piece. And, and this kind of walks you through the steps of creating that same kind of content with your, with your students who may be virtual. Um, just all kinds of different ways that you can use video in the classroom. Um, and they kind of teach you how to do that through these lessons in this, um, in this OK Sandbox. So moving on to kind of these others, we're going to get into some, some kind of some cool stuff here. So again, the kind of beta side of things, Chrome has these what they call Chrome experience, experiments. So it's a showroom of these different, um, different uh, types of, of tools that have been created inside of, of Chrome. And they, they haven't been released to the general public, but they are 
Very cool. And there's some very interesting, you know, tools or um, experiments that are going on inside of the Google uh, Chrome experiment experiment. So if you have time or when you have time, that would be one that I would uh, highly recommend you jump into and, and, and look around. You can do searches in there for different types of, of um, articles. Chrome Music Lab, um, this is super cool, especially for music teachers because it really does um, allow you to kind of break down the different aspects of music. So if you go a little bit, if you go to the next one, Dean, what you notice is that some of these, like we got the rhythm piece here and um, Dean, you wanna go to that? Yeah, there we go, uh, yeah. We might as well go in here and check it out. So notice we have these different um, tiles here that we can access. And so Dean's gonna play some rhythm here. He's gonna just hit play. That's well, not bringing in your sound, is it? Oh, there it goes. So notice he can put in different types of sounds here as he goes through and when he hits play, it will actually play that. Now he's going to add some more here. He's going to add a bunch of stuff. And then he hits that play button. No, it's stupid. <laughs> so I, can you guys hear that? I can't hear that. So, but You can't hear it? No, -uh, not coming through on our end. OK. Let but me, it's probably, let's... it sounds really good, I'm thinking. You know, I'm a composer. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so musically talented. And Jeff's well, but, but, but in, in all reality, you could be a composer, you know, using these different tools inside of the Chrome uh, Music Lab. Let me, let me try that one more time, and then we should be able to hear some audio with this. That's definitely it. That's it. Yeah. Let's let's change it up a little bit, right? So we're gonna yep. Yep. change it up a little bit. Yeah. See that I rhythm about, I have right there. Yeah. Think about how you could actually, you know, engage your students in creating these different, you know, in this case, a rhythm, right? Using the drums and the and the, the triangle there. So if you go to yeah, you go to the next slide. It's just really gonna walk us through these different um lessons uh, using the chrome music lab um this is kind of a cool one because you can actually see what sound looks like right using your spectrogram um and um using those pieces you notice on the bottom you have the different sounds and from those sounds you could get a different um different uh, spectral wave i guess so we're going to jump into that guy That's for, for my students when I've seen this, I don't think they understood what yeah, that sound was, this wave, right? And what that might look like. So that visual representation of a sound wave, I think it's powerful for, for not just music, but also for, for science as well. Cool. Now, I'm not oh. gonna play the piano, so I'm gonna draw the oh. line somewhere. <laughs> so again, just gives you a, a whole bunch of different tools inside of this one. This one is the uh, keyboard, it gives you a, two different octaves that you can play. Um, and, it, and, and then of course you can practice those chords in those octaves, right? So uh, again, a, a great way to practice some of this, these things in our virtual environment that maybe we couldn't do without some of these tools, right? We might not have access to a piano at our house, but yet we can continue our music lessons or whatever the case is with some of these tools. Um, again, sound waves, we can talk about those. Um, the keyboard that represents that, the arpeggios. Um, I have no idea what that means because it's music. And, and um, <laughs> maybe maybe somebody with some music background can jump on the mic and explain what, what's actually happening here. But it's allowing that visual representation of chords, right? Did I get that right? Anybody? Somebody has to know what this means.
All right. Thank you, Susan. All right. So um, this one's kind of interesting. So Kandinsky was this artist and he was known for taking music and representing that into a painting, right? So this Chrome Music Lab experiment does just that. It allows you to draw and it changes your drawing into um, musical notes and musical chords. So it's kind of an interesting piece. Hey. All right. Sounds like somebody else is joining us on the microphone. Camille, is that you? All right, Melody Maker, again, much like the Rhythm Maker, except this one allows you to do different uh, sounds, um, actually create a, a musical composition, create harmony, all of those great things within the, the Chrome Music Lab. Um, voice Spinner, again, all of these are just really cool things that represent audio and, and video combined, right? So think about how you can use these to teach different things. This one, again, Jeff talked about the visual representation of wavelength. And so what does that mean as far as what sound you hear, right? So what does a longer wavelength mean versus a short wavelength? And, and how does that transfer um, knowledge or energy? Piano roll um, displays famous songs and then plays them so you can hear all of the different keys and chords. And then of course you can record your, your voice and it will change that into a visual, visual representation of your voice as well. The oscillator section. Um, so this is kind of the younger kids. It features all these creatures who show different frequencies. And so again, you can modify it. You can move them high and low. Um, it's useful for showing high versus low as well as speed of waves at different pitches. Chrome strings. So we'll just kind of go through these a little bit faster. We only have a few minutes left here. <clears throat> um, so the song maker is one of our favorites because you can actually have students create songs, share them again, because it's web-based, you can have some of this sharing and collaboration that goes along with, with building some of these tools, these, these songs. Um, Google Trends is a little bit different. Jeff, do you want to jump in on that yeah. one? Yeah, it's so uh, basically it's, it's looking at trending topics over time. So you can actually search for um, different data trends and, uh, and, and there's a visualization tool also that, uh, that goes with that. So that's, um, you know, Google as it, as it tracks data, it's, um, it's really, it's, it's really taking and using that data to, to, to really look at trends. So right now, if I click on that, right now in the U.S., it looks like Taylor Swift and Kim Kardashian are trending, right? Um, football, American football is trending right now. A lot of coronavirus search trends, as you might imagine. And so if I click on that under trends, it's going to kind of give me the breakdown of, of you know, what's happening um, on Google search uh, based on a certain um, topic there. It gives you lots of data that you can kind of move through in order to, uh, you know, kind of look at where, um, look at where those searches lead you know, and use that data to, to kind of help find uh, information on certain topics as well. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dean. Yeah. Yeah. So the Ngram viewer is kind of interesting because oftentimes we want to know when a, a certain word hit our culture, right? So we can go into our Ngram viewer and let's search for coronavirus, for example, and it will show this graph of when coronavirus actually kind of entered our society and, and, and when that word became a, um, something that folks are searching for and being used in literature and all of those things. So um, it's, it's a really interesting search, uh, especially when we start searching some of those things that we use all the time and, and see where those words originate from. The next one, uh, Google Translate. I'm sure that, that most of you have used Google Translate. It's incredibly powerful. And, and there, I don't even remember how many languages, over 60 languages now, that they're translating into from 
um, from not just uh, English, but uh, from lots of other languages. The Translate app that you can get either on your iPhone or your Android phone, it does even more. You can actually use that to hold up to a sign written in a different language. And then you can actually, it will actually translate that sign to the, the language that you've chosen on your, um, on your phone app. So that's it. Looks like a little like world lens where you can hold it up and it will give you the um, translation of that sign in your um, kind of default language. If, if you haven't used the Google Opinion Rewards, this is, a, this is a great tool. So basically now, some of you may not want to do this because it's kind of looking for, um, it's, it's using your location data to figure out where you've been. So for example, I go to Ace Hardware about every hour um, on a given day. And it, usually when I'm there, we'll actually say, hey, there's a new survey for you to fill out. And what it will do is it will ask me, where, were the, where was the last place or where, which of these places have you visited? And it'll give me some of those places and it typically will give me an Ace Hardware. I select it, it asks me if I made a uh, purchase with my credit card or cash or whatever, I check the appropriate box and it says, hey, do you have a receipt? I can choose to scan in the receipt, which I typically don't, but every time I fill out a reward, I get money, right? So I get money from Google. So right now I think my balance is fairly low. I think it's like $3, but over the course of having this app for I think three years, I have actually generated over $300 in um, rewards or money, right? Credits from the Google Play Store. I wouldn't probably use this for students, but as a, as a you know, individual, um, I just use that for Google Play movies. You know, when the family and I want to watch a movie, we typically go to Google Play and we use that credit to, to purchase a movie. So easy way to, to do that. Yeah, and in the chat, um, folks are saying, yeah, it probably is an issue with students, but as Jeff said, probably use this with our, our adult devices. Um, just a way for you to purchase some music for free or videos for free or whatever the case is if, if you're interested in doing something like that. Um, the next one is this mystery animal. So this is the Google Voice ex experiment. Um, you can ask this game 20 questions. So let's just go ahead and give this a try, right? So um, we're going to go ahead and Yes or no questions. Oh, I guess you have to use your Google Home, but I think you can. Let's just. Hey there, I'm the mystery animal. To figure out what kind of animal I am, you'll have to ask me up to 20 yes or no questions. Questions like, are you a mammal or do you have feathers? If you're ready, then start asking away. So what should our first question be? Are you a mammal? Are you a mammal? Try asking me yes or no question. Are you a mammal? Afraid not, I am not a type of mammal. Are you a mineral? Are you a mineral? Here's a hint. This game is called Mystery Animal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> a little sarcasm. Are you a bird? Are you a bird? Yes, I am a type of bird. Ooh, we're getting closer. Anybody? Do you live okay. in North America? Do you live in North America? Sure, I live in North America and I love it here. <laughs> Can you fly? Okay. Can you fly? Indeed, I fly. Just so you know, you have 15 questions left. Do you eat fish? Yum, 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 yum. Oops, got carried away. Yes, I love eating fish. <laughs> British accent, yes, yeah. <laughs> Are you a raptor? That doesn't seem relevant. Anybody? Are you an eagle? 
Are you an eagle? <laughs> Holy moly, I thought my secret was safe. I am indeed an eagle. It only took you eight questions to figure it out. If you want to keep playing, say start a new round. So, mystery animal, kind of fun and clever, right? So the, this one is a, um, another Google Voice experiment. It takes um, your voice and you, using Google's artificial intelligence, um, it changes it into a meme buddy, right? So you can, you can create your own memes using your own voice by utilizing this uh, Google experiment. Um, I haven't really tried that one, but it looked very interesting. Solve for X, um, this is a think tank project. So this is one that's really interesting because um, this algorithm, this, this uh, Google project is actually doing real world work, right? It's solving real problems in our world. So um, scientists, inventors, they're using this Solve for X to help them think critically through some of these questions that are being asked. So again, one of those, those big things that Google's trying to use artificial in intelligence to um, not only solve problems, but solve real world problems that could potentially um, help our environment and, and those types of things, okay? Constitute Project. The Constitute Project is a, um, is a site that helps folks write a constitution. So maybe you're working with high school kids and you want them to say, hey, this is your country, how would you change the constitution, right? So it has all of these um, countries' constitutions as examples, and it helps you drill down in and think about specific themes and topics that are important while um, thinking about writing that constitution. Spell, spell up. up. Oh, let me go with this. I'll, I'll, I'll go to you. So spell up a game where you basically you're spelling words and um, the more words as you as long as you spell the words correctly, it's going to continue to build, building and building the highest word tower. As you go up, the words will get more difficult. And so just kind of a game challenge or a challenging game uh, to use with kids to help with their, um, their spelling practice. Google Search Console. So yeah, some of you have seen that kind of the search consoles that it allows you to analyze data um, and get some diagnostics or some, some metrics on the information uh, that comes out of the, uh, the, the different searches that are done by users um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world. So um, again, this is what Google uses to help with their search algorithm to build that into what most considered to be mo the most powerful search algorithm around. And then what do we have next? Let's see. Yeah, these yeah. Are, oh, go ahead, Dean. Go ahead. Yeah, so we have some search Easter eggs for you in your Google search. So, um, whoops. If you type the word Pac-Man in a Google search, guess what you get? You get a game to play, right? You get to play Pac-Man. So you can actually play a Pac-Man game. So that's one of the things, right? Um, how about the um, tilt? So this one's kind of fun too. If you type in, oh, tilt must not work any longer. Let's see if ASCII works. Nil, let's try do a barrel roll. So notice if you type in do a barrel roll into Google search, it rolls your screen, right? So um, just all these kind of fun little Easter egg nuggets inside of Google search that you can try um, as, as you pull these little nuggets out. Let's see if breakout works. Breakout works, yeah, definitely works. Yeah. So um, just a, a kind of a real fun way to do different things in your classroom to engage your students, right? So the Harlem Shake, um, all kinds of fun things you can do inside of your search search bar. All right, we went super fast through those. 
Um, so just a few folks who helped us put together the, the presentation today. Um, Dean, real quick, just um, um, one of the things that we wanted to mention um, in, in terms of the special thanks here is uh, Blackfoot has done so much to, um, to, to make this conference go. I know they extended the invitation to, I think, 250 individuals uh, to, to join the conference for free. I know Dean mentioned uh, in the keynote how um, much Blackfoot has done to help support uh, schools throughout this entire, you know, COVID uh, pandemic piece here. So uh, before we go, we just want to make sure that um, you know that the sole sponsor of this uh, conference is um, Blackfoot. And again, their um, support um, for the conference has been going on for, I want to say, 10 years or more now. So just make sure that uh, um, that if you see a Blackfoot representative, you, you let them know, just tell them thank you for all that they've done for, for schools around Montana. Excellent. Um, anything else, Jeff? I think that's it. If you didn't get that, I'll see if I can't post that link back in here so that everybody has that. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, Lisa's asking for a uh, contact info so they can write thank you notes. Uh, we will get that and we will have that. Um, we'll have that at the end session. How about that? Now I've got to go back and find that link now in just a second. <laughs> oh shoot, it's just gonna, it's gonna be easier for me to just go get it off the, the web, the, this presentation here. Yeah. All right, so um, a quick hour break for lunch and then sessions start back up at one o'clock, I believe. Is that correct, Jeff? Yep. Excellent, thank you all for attending again resources galore of course they're not all going to work for everyone but pick and choose something that that works for you and uh have fun with it there's lots of fun stuff in there too so, so the good question about uh credits um uh, renewal units so one of the things we're going to do is we're just going to save our chat uh string here so that we have a a sense of who was in the the the, the, the session and who was not um that just kind of gives us the ability to um keep track of that and pass those on to Daisy. Excellent. Thanks guys. Looks like people are throwing in their names in there. Thank you for doing that. You show to Sharda when you come. Oh, bring that list to Sharda when we come. Yes, we can. We have this digitally, so we can bring that to Sharda. <laughs> it's a good question, Noel. We'll we'll get with uh, Daisy and and um, figure out how she wants to do the um, OPI credit piece. Remember, if you're taking this for graduate credit, that there is a mandatory meeting tomorrow at 7.30 that, um, where we'll go over some of the questions you might have about the college credit. Download it just a line. Yeah, somebody's gonna have fun with that. Is that Ashley? Yeah. So that's, I think that's probably what you're gonna do over lunch, right, Ashley? <laughs> <laughs>